Welcome to the Cold Case Christianity Broadcast, the only Christian case-making program hosted by a cold case homicide detective. J. Warner Wallace has been investigating cold case murders in Los Angeles County for over a decade. His work has been featured on Fox News, Court TV, and Dateline. For more information about Jim's work and the case for Christianity, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. Now, here's your host, J. Warner Wallace. Well, thanks for joining us once again at Cold Case Christianity. As you know, if you watched last week, and those are available uh, both on our YouTube page, uh, if you go to the coldcasechristianity.com um, and you look at our YouTube link, you'll see that we are posting and archiving all of our broadcast shows. So if you missed last week, which is the introduction to what we're going to talk about tonight, uh, you can catch it there. And here's what we've been doing. We've been looking at, um, we're starting this week, to look at evidence in the universe and ask ourselves, can this be explained by staying inside the room or do you have to go outside the room? Here's what I mean. In working death scenes, we typically separate non-criminal deaths from murders by asking the question, if I walk in this room with this dead guy, can I explain everything I see in the room by staying in the room? If I can, it's probably not a murder. It's probably going to be an accidental, a natural, or a suicide. So for example, if there's a dead guy in the room and a handgun and he happens to have a, an injury, a gunshot wound, but the handgun is registered to him, the doors are locked, the only DNA and evidence in the room belongs to him, well then I can explain everything in the room by staying in the room. That gun was in there all the time. Maybe there's even a suicide note that's been in the room from the very beginning. It's going to be a suicide or an accidental. On the other hand, if that gun's not his, and there's DNA, foreign DNA, foreign fingerprints, and there's even bloody footsteps leading out a door which is open, okay, I can't explain that evidence by staying in the room. I've got to go outside the room in order to explain it. Well, anytime you have to go outside the room to explain evidence inside the room, you have to consider the reasonable inference of an intruder. And when that happens, everything changes. Now, we're starting this week to look at uh, two of eight pieces of evidence inside the room of the universe to ask the question, can I explain this stuff by staying inside the room? And we're going to start this week with two pieces of cosmological evidence. And so we're going to examine it and then ask the question, can I explain it from inside the room? This is the approach we're taking in a new book I just finished writing. It's, it's actually published uh, just very recently called God's Crime Scene. So let's take a look at the first two pieces of evidence and ask ourselves this question. Can we stay inside the room? to describe the cosmological evidence we see in the universe. Starting at the very beginning, we're in a universe that has a beginning. Did you know that? The universe is not infinitely old. The universe began to exist. And we know that not just from scripture in Genesis 1. Forget about that. We're not going to use any scripture to make our case tonight. We're just going to use the science that's available to us. Now, I can tell you in every crime scene, and by the way, if you take, spend nine years in art school like I did before I became a cop, the only thing you really can do with that nine years of art school is you can illustrate your own book. Okay, so <laughs> you're going to see that I'm using illustrations from the book, which I illustrated just for the sake of, you know, because I could, basically. I once had a case at a crime scene where when I got there, there was a piece of foam rubber next to the body of the victim. It was from 1988, and for years, nobody could figure out what this foam rubber was. But I knew that this was the key to the entire case. Why? Because how the foam rubber gets in the room is critically important. Was it, did it belong to the victim? Did she bring it in with her? Did it belong to the restaurant where the murder occurred? Had it been there all along? Did it start off in the room? Or did this come into the room when the suspect came in the room? If it's the last one, well, that's a piece of evidence I'm interested in. It turned out that, yes, the suspect was a guy who used to wear boots, but he would never untie his boots. And when he would take his boots on and off, he eventually wore out the cuff at the back of the boot. And on this night, as he was bending down to take the victim's money, the rubber foam from the cuff of the boot popped out, and he left it there. So now I have an origination of a piece of evidence. I now know what caused it. And finally, if I, went, did, I did a search warrant at his house 30 years later, for his entire life, he's been wearing shoes like that and taking them off that way. And every shoe he owned had the same pattern of wear. So it was a powerful explanation for what caused the foam. So why a piece of evidence 
is in the room is important to me. How it begins to appear in the room is important to me. This idea of origination is critically important. And here we're gonna look at something before we can even start talking about evidence in the room. We have to ask the question, how did the room get there? The room in this case is the universe. It turns out there is very good physical evidence that demonstrates we are in a universe that has a beginning. I have an entire chapter on this, and because I love you guys, I'm not gonna talk about it tonight. <laughs> I'm just gonna show you the kinds of scientific, philosophical evidence in very different categories that all point to the same conclusion. And that conclusion is that we are in a universe that came into being from nothing. That's not my position as a theist, that is the position of physicists who are doing this work, and that's why the standard cosmological model in physics is called the Big Bang Cosmological Model. Now, why it's called that, I don't want you to get hung up on Big Bang. Sometimes as Christians, we do. Big Bang does not dictate a certain age of the universe, and Big Bang does not also dictate that evolution is true. You can reject evolution, even theistic evolution, and you can reject a given age of the universe, yet still hold the Big Bang cosmology. Because the one thing the Big Bang cosmology teaches from a science perspective is that everything came into existence from nothing. That's huge. And the most skeptical atheists already recognize this. Alexander Vilenkin, who's at Tufts University, is a Russian cosmologist, says it this way. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is now no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. And even Stephen Hawking writes it this way. Hawking and Penrose together wrote several volumes. Here he says, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Wow, think about that for a second. Big Bang cosmology, the standard cosmological argument, a standard cosmological model, argues that everything began from nothing. And when I say everything, I mean all space, time, and matter. Wait a minute, space? Space is not something, space is nothing. No, space is something. Time is something, and of course, matter is something. Well, if space is something and it's not nothing, what is nothing? Aristotle put it this way, nothing is what rocks dream about. That's what nothing is. Space is something. And I'm not uncomfortable with Big Bang cosmology. Why? Because we know that Big Bangs require Big Bangers. <laughs> right? And the question, of course, is what is this Big Banger? Well, I can tell you one thing. It bangs all space, time, and matter into existence, according to the science. And if that's the case, the thing that bangs all space, time, and matter into existence cannot itself be space, time, or matter, because the beginning of that stuff is the beginning of our universe. So whatever this big banger is, it has to be a non-spatial, non-material, atemporal banger. What could that be? Now, atheists, I, in my book, I spend a lot of time talking about the alternatives. I'm not just going to give you the explanation from outside the room. I want to show you every explanation from those folks who want to describe it from inside the room, and I'll show you why they don't work. But tonight, because I love you guys, I'm not going to kill you with that, but I want to show you one thing for sure. If you work criminal trials, you recognize something. When defense attorneys argue against you, and there, you have the truth. I've even had cases where after they argued against us for eight weeks, we convicted the guy, and at sentencing, he confessed to the entire crime. So clearly, the entire time, the defense attorney was arguing against the truth. And when they're doing that, they're doing it usually in one of three ways. One, they're gonna argue something that's not supported by the evidence, or two, they're re gonna redefine the terminology to make it easier to let them, let them go, or three, they're gonna make some kind of logical flaw. It turns out the same thing happens with explanations from inside the room against the kind of evidence I'm showing you. So for example, this is from the book, some people will say, well, why can't, well, maybe we're wrong about the nature of time. If we redefine what we mean by time, we can avoid the beginning of time. Okay, that's one possible approach. 
Some people will say, well, couldn't the universe be expanding, but not from nothing? Maybe it's expanding and contracting cyclically, and we just happen to be in an expansion period right now, which makes it look like the universe came from nothing, but it could be contracted and then expanding again. The problem, of course, is that the science does not help their case because there's not enough mass and gravitational forces to cause the, the, the actual. As a matter of fact, the universe is not slowing down in its expansion so it can recollapse. It's actually speeding up in its expansion. Or maybe we've got an issue, but maybe there's a larger eternal environment. By the way, everyone. Atheists and theists alike are looking for the first eternal cause of the universe. Have you ever had someone say to you, well, if you believe in God, who created God? Well, no, no. The definition of God, from our perspective, is the uncreated creator of everything. So when you're asking who created the uncreated creator, that's a silly question. And by the way, you atheists also believe there's an uncreated creator. Creator. Some of you believe it's a quantum environment from which universes emerge. Some of you believe there's some kind of multiverse generator that creates an infinite number of universes. But regardless, whatever you say it is, you believe it's eternal. So here's the problem with these kinds of solutions. They keep you in the room, for sure. But they have evidential problems. So for example, if you try to redefine time like Hawking has done, he'll even admit if you go back to the way time really is, his theory falls apart. And not only that, if you're talking about a cyclical universe, this is not supported by evidence. But there is a theory out there that seems very provocative to some people, and it's called multiverse theory. There's an environment out there that's producing an infinite number of universes. Ours is just but one. But the thing that's creating this universe is something, guess what? It's something external to our universe. So this theory about multiverse theory right away concedes that you have to have an outside source that's creating the universe. The problem with this theory is that it's logically inconsistent for a number of reasons. I'll just give you the clearest one. What is the multiverse generator? What is this environment like that the multiverse generator is in. Think about this. This is what Lawrence Krauss says about this. He's a physicist at Arizona State University. He wrote a book called Universe from Nothing. He was on Stephen Colbert's show, the old show, okay? And he was interviewed, and this is what he said about this environment with this multiverse generator. He says, you know, physics has changed what we mean by nothing. Empty space is a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles popping in and out of existence. And if you wait long enough, that kind of nothing will always produce particles. Those particles could then grow into universes. What if there's like a big pot of boiling water that bubbles are emerging in? Each one's a universe. It emerges without a cause and becomes a universe. And there's an infinite number of these. Really? Well, what's the pot of water like? Remember, it can't be space, time, or matter, because that stuff begins at the beginning of our universe. But he says that environment is, wait a minute, he says it's empty space. Well, no, Stephen, or uh, at Lawrence, it can't be space. Your, your space is going to be created as a result. You can't start with space to get space. Then he says, well, there's virtual particles, so you have some form of energy in the, wait a minute, no, no, no Lawrence. You can't start with space and matter. We're trying to describe how space and matter got here. Then he says, well, if you wait long, oh, great. So now you've got time, too. So what he's basically saying is, if you start with space, time, and matter, you can get space, time, and matter. Well, no, duh. That doesn't help us. It's logically inconsistent. And you see this a lot in this kind of thinking. But of course, if there is something out there that's all powerful, non-spatial, atemporal, non-material, that could begin this, that would explain all of it. I don't think that this piece of evidence in and of itself points to God. This is one piece of a larger case. We have to look elsewhere. For example, we have a, be in a universe that has a beginning, but it also appears to be fine-tuned for life. This has been a perplexing problem for atheists for a number of years. As a matter of fact, Anthony Flew, when he first uh, became a theist, a deist probably, he did so because of this problem. We're in a universe that appears to be tampered with. I worked a case one year where a lady died in the upper store bedroom, upper floor bedroom of her house. When I got there and we investigated the background story to this thing, her husband and her had been fighting for years. And they had to turn the gas off in the house, but the husband who didn't even live there anymore had re 
had turned the gas back on a week prior to, the, to her, death, her death. Now she's dead upstairs. Why? Because she's been asphyxiated in a house filled with natural gas. Well, her and her baby, both. So the question is, okay, we get there. Not only that, but when the mother-in-law first showed up, she saw that right around the house, several things, doors that were not usually open, windows that were frozen in one position had been changed. Never seen that before. Looked like somebody had tampered with the house. And even at the room itself, pocket door that was stuck in place was now closed, and there was even clothing against the bottom of that door, which wouldn't allow the gas to escape from the bedroom. And the pilot light and the upstairs wall heater had been extinguished. Really? When you start to see this kind of tampering at several layers, I think we had a suspect in mind. This doesn't happen. This is not a bad coincidence. I've got tampering at several layers. It turns out this kind of tampering also is seen in the universe. At the foundational level, you see it even at the laws of just weak and strong nuclear forces at the, at the center of the atom. You see that these have to be so finely tuned to within a razor's edge that the smallest variation in the universal constants would create a universe in which no life could emerge. As a matter of fact, physicists don't even think the universe could emerge. If the smallest changes in the strong force, in the weak force, in electromagnetism, and forces of gravity, even at the level of just the elements themselves, the smallest variation, you would not have a universe like ours that supports life. That's just at the foundational level. At the regional level of our galaxy, galaxies have to be shaped just a certain way in order for life to emerge. You have to be a certain size, a certain mass, a certain shape, a certain location in the universe in order for life to emerge. We happen to have one of those. We're in it. As a matter of fact, at that same regional level, the star system you happen to be in has to be arranged a certain way with a certain shape, a certain number of planets, a certain location within the spiral arm. Too close, too far out doesn't work. These are fine-tuned constants that have to be present at the regional level. And then when we get to our planet, oh my gosh, there are certain criteria for the planet that have to be in place. You know, the idea of a planet that supports life is crazy, given what's required. What's required in terms of simple things like the position next to the sun, the tilt of the actual planet relationship to the sun, the, the, the kind of atmosphere, the kind of terrestrial crust, the kinds of components in that terrestrial crust, even the size of our moon. These things are absolutely necessary in order for life to exist on planet Earth. So at the foundational level, the regional level, the locational level, everything has to be just so, like in Goldilocks, right? Not too hot, not too cold but just right. And the margin of error is crazy, crazy fine-tuned. So it turns out that these kinds of layers of evidence you see in our murder scene are very similar to what we see for life to emerge on the planet. You have foundational layer of fine-tuning of the constants. You have a regional layer of the galaxy and the solar system, and then a very fine-tuned elements related to the planet itself. So these elements, imagine, for example, if I told you we were going to take a ship ride, uh, get in a, a cockpit of an of a, a airplane or a rocket ship, and we're going to go to a very specific place. If you had all of these gauges, hundreds and hundreds of gauges, it turns out you would have to fine tune each gauge to within a hair trigger precision measurement. And each one of these dependent on the others. All of these have to be perfectly tuned. These are all the universal constants of both our universe, the galaxy, the solar system, and the planet that have to be just so. And if there's a small variation on any one of these, life does not emerge in planet, on planet Earth, anywhere in the, in the universe. This kind of thing is really hard to understand how it could be so... I'm going to tell you something. I did this little illustration for you. I didn't even do half of the fine-tuning that's required I didn't have space on this, on this cockpit to do what really is required. The number of universal constants is staggering. And they are all geared toward a certain destination in mind. The destination is a planet that supports the kind of life that you and I experience. Very unique. In fact, I'm trying to quote mostly atheists here. The unique nature of the fine tuning is disturbing for those who don't believe in a fine tuner. Even, you'll see people say things like this, it's shocking to find how many of the familiar constants of the universe lie within a very narrow band that makes life possible. If a single one of these accidents 
were altered, stars would never form, the universe would fly apart, DNA would not exist, life as we know it would be impossible, Earth would flip over or freeze, and so on. A little bit dramatic, but you get the point. This stuff is incredibly fine-tuned. How do we explain it? Well, there's only a couple of ways to explain it by staying inside the room. One way is simply to say, hey, maybe it's just chance. Really? Okay. Can you imagine if I walked into that scene at the house and I said, wow, you know, I see some things, but it's probably just chance. No investigation, let it go. I think you'd say I was derelict of duty. You'd say you need to investigate. That doesn't look like chance to me. This ignores the incredible fine-tuning of the universe altogether. Or you might say, well, maybe it's some kind of physical necessity. Maybe the laws have to be set that way because any variation would be physically impossible. Not true. Physicists themselves will say, no, the fine-tuning of the universe does not have to be this way. As a matter of fact, if you believe in multiverse theory, you believe there are a number of universes that are tuned differently with a different set of physical laws. So it doesn't have to be. It's not a matter of physical necessity. But maybe we go back to the multiverse. Couldn't the multiverse explain this? If you have an infinite number of universes all slightly different, shouldn't one look like ours? I think so. I think in some ways people rush to multiverse theory because of the fine-tuning they see. By the way, there's no physical evidence pointing to a multiverse. But the fact we can't explain the fine-tuning might incline us to believe in a multiverse. But here's the problem. If we stay in the room by using either chance or physical law, these don't work. And they don't work. I've done entire chapters on this. I won't drag you through this right now. But they're unsupported by the evidence. And even if I could say there was some constant between the physical laws and the level of the, of the, uh, of the, of the atom, that would not explain the unusual galaxy, solar system, and planet we happen to live on. So we go to the third quick thing. Okay, well, maybe it's a multiverse. Once again, if it's a multiverse generator, guess what? You've already conceded an external source. You already agree with me. The best explanation is outside the room, not inside the room. But this has problems because it lacks all space, time, and matter. Remember, we already talked about that. But not only that, if this thing can create the kinds of universes in which we emerge, wouldn't you have to argue that this thing also has to be fine-tuned to some degree? This multiverse generator, Matt Richard Swinburne says it this way. He says, look, any proposed multiverse mechanism, like that pot of boiling water, needs to have a certain form rather than innumerable possible other forms, and probably constants, too, that need fine-tuning in the narrow sense. So the, all you've done is kick the problem of fine-tuning down the road, but you still have to account for fine-tuning. So you have two things. You have two pieces of evidence. If there happens to be an all-powerful fine-tuner who's got a purpose in mind, that would explain this, but he'd have to be outside the or it, whatever this is, a force, whatever it is, would have to be outside the room. Be sure to visit the Cold Case Christianity website daily to read Jim's blog, watch the weekly video, or listen to the Cold Case Christianity podcast. You'll also find great free resources, including the free downloadable monthly Bible insert. While you're there, be sure to sign up for Jim's daily case note email. Cold Case Christianity is designed to help you become a better Christian case maker. Be sure to download the free Cold Case Christianity app from the iTunes Store and the Android Marketplace. The Cold Case Christianity app puts all the resources from coldcasechristianity.com in the palm of your hand. You can read the daily blog, listen to podcasts, and watch videos from within the application. And Jim uses the app to send direct messages to fans of Cold Case Christianity. The app will also link you to all Cold Case Christianity social media and provide you with a direct connection to Jay Warner Wallace. Download the app today and become a better Christian casemaker. Have you ever questioned the resurrection or know someone who has? Follow along with J. Warner Wallace as he examines the most important case in all of history. You'll learn how to think like a cold case detective and share the compelling evidence that Jesus truly is alive. We need to share the good news with those who desperately need to hear it. Will you become a case maker for Christ? Order alive in packages of 10 and begin sharing the most important message of all, the truth of the resurrection.
Okay, I hope that was helpful as you kind of look at the first two pieces of evidence. The, these are, you know, you're going to see we're going to cover four different categories of evidence over the next, what, four weeks before we finish this series. And what's so powerful about that, you'll see in the last week, is when you get evidence in different categories that all point to the same reasonable inference, you've probably got a pretty good inference. And we started off this week with two pieces of evidence are in a category we would call cosmological evidence because they deal uniquely with the nature of the universe itself, as you just saw, the beginning of a universe and the fine tuning we see in that universe. And in asking this question, can we, exp already you've seen, we have to go outside the room to explain the room and the fine tuning we see in the room. And even atheists are willing to go outside of naturalism, given that naturalism is simply how we explain things with the three things that naturalism provides, space, time, and matter, and the laws of physics and chemistry that govern those things. Well, whatever those do, those, we can't get what we need from that. We're gonna have to go outside of space, time, matter, and the laws that govern such things. We are already into something extra, supra, natural in order to explain what we have come to call the natural environment of the universe. So already, we've already conceded we're somewhat outside the room for the best explanation. The room cannot create the room. And that's the problem. So next week, we'll add to that by going into two pieces of evidence that are really um, biological in nature, the origin of life and the fine tuning we see. Uh, the design, appearance of design we see in biological structures. So I hope that between these two categories of evidence, you'll see, and I'm going to do two more after that, that the, the diversity of categories is really one of the things that inclines us to believe. If they're all pointing to the same kind of, uh, of explanation. Uh, now, what we're doing here is covering material that is in my book, God's Crime Scene. And in order to get that book, uh, again, I, I write a lot at, at coldcasechristianity.com. And my goal is not to sell you a book. If you want to get a book that gives you the most depth of all we're talking about, then of course that's where you want to go. But I write every week, three times a week, at coldcasechristianity.com. And I want to provide you with um, a way to kind of explore these ideas. And I send out an email every day, five days a week, with either a video, a podcast, or an article that will take you a little bit deeper. So if nothing else, you can go there and sign up. Those materials are all free. And if you want, of course, to get either Cold Case Christianity or God's Crime Scene, you can get God's Crime Scene at godscrimescene.com or at coldcasechristianity.com or at any bookseller in either audio, ebook, Kindle, Nook, all those versions are available. All right? Hope that helps you. And next week we go into two more pieces of evidence as we examine eight pieces of evidence in the universe. Hope this has been helpful for you. And I'll see you right here next week at Cold Case Christianity. Thanks for joining us at the Cold Case Christianity broadcast. If you're interested in more information about this week's topic, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. For a thorough investigation of the reliability of the New Testament Gospels and the case for Christianity, be sure to purchase Cold Case Christianity, a homicide detective investigates the claims of the Gospels. It's available wherever books are sold. This program was made possible through your generous donations to NRB-TV. Join Jim Wallace and others for the 4th Annual Defending Truth Conference. For information and tickets, visit nrbtv.org slash DTC. Hi, my name is Rod Hembry. This is my family, and every single day right here on the NRB Network, we study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Right here on the NRB Network, the program is called Quick Study, and we study all...